Hello, this is Nathan Wood, pastor of North Dayton Baptist Church, and welcome to Day 97 of the McShane Reading Plan. So glad you could join us. We're in Leviticus 10, Psalms 11 and 12, Proverbs 25, and 1 Thessalonians 4. Um, one of those five chapter days, there's a lot here. Um, we've spoken frequently, I've referenced Nadab and Abihu, um, burning strange fire before the Lord. Folks, it's not our prerogative to worship God the way that we choose. Um, that being said, by the time we get down to the end, we have Moses and Aaron having a debate regarding what happened with this sacrifice, why wasn't it eaten in this place by these people, and Aaron gives some technicalities and Moses is satisfied. And it's a mess. And yeah, it's going to be a mess when human righteousness, even at its most obedient, is put up against God's righteousness. Folks, the, the ironic priesthood was going to fail. They could not perform, try as they may, they could not perform perfectly. There's only one perfect high priest, and it's in his blood in his sacrifice, and in the power of his resurrection, that we can be uh, brought before the presence of the Father, unstained, because we are washed in his blood, if we trust in him, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our high priest, he is our perfect sacrifice, and he was the prophet like unto Moses. Um, remember, he said to the woman at the well, uh, when she was debating about the style of worship, and it was a big deal. Style of worship was just as big a deal as as who you worshipped. So it was not enough to worship the one true God of Israel. You had to worship him the way that he demanded to be worshipped. Well, Jesus said the time, time's coming when those who worship will worship in spirit and in truth, and it won't be a matter of uh, Gerizim versus Zion. And Zion was always the high place. Zion was always the correct place. It still is the correct place. Um, that's, where, uh, that's where the capital of the world will eternally be. Jesus, New Jerusalem, will come down. Jerusalem is Zion. Um, that heavenly Zion will meet the earthly Zion. Jesus will split the Mount of Olives in two at his second coming and walk through the eastern gate onto Zion. Um, it is a big deal, but where is the real temple? The real temple Christ wants is in our hearts. He wants to sit on the throne of our hearts. And he wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. See, when we're in him, it's not about the kind of fire. It's not about the kind of music. It's not about the version of Bible. Sorry, you might have a preference. I have preference too. I read King James, but... We don't worship a translation. Unless you read Hebrew and Greek, it's an ancient Hebrew at that. And guess what? There are no original manuscripts left. They're all copies. We don't worship a book or a translation of a book. We do the best we can to get the word of God from what sources that we have. But the true word of God is Jesus Christ, whom all these people were testifying across the ages. That's the point. We don't worship a holy scripture. We're not like Islam that deifies a book that is way more flawed than the Bible. And again, I'm not saying that the Bible contradicts itself. I'm talking about historicity and variations in translation and slight changes in wording. It's not thematically contradictory. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, but what I'm saying is, is that Christ is the Word of God. We have the Bible, and yes, we can put our faith and trust in what it says. There are not enough technicalities to contradict the message of the gospel, that Jesus is God, that he died, that he was buried, that he rose again, and that he was prophesied of, and that he has promised to return. All of it's there. All of it's there. And... It's so important because it's not a list of do's and don'ts. Um, 
like one version might say, well, you might want to do this or you might want to do that. Guess what? In Christ, in Christ, the, uter the, the details really don't matter in the law of Moses. Why? Because it's not a salvation of do's and don'ts. And when we are born again, we're to emulate him. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us to guide us. But folks, if we are born again, children of God, and we don't know right from wrong, then we don't know how to listen to the Holy Spirit, or we're not saved to begin with. And I don't mean to be mean-spirited there. I mean that with all love. A real, true believer in Christ Jesus will, with love in their heart, understand what sin is. And again, part of sin is arrogance. That is a huge sin. Hatefulness. So there are people who will, uh, thump people with Bibles over things that are really sin, and they themselves are sinning and doing so. Um, but that doesn't make it wrong to tell somebody, hey, listen, you're going the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. And I don't mean to get on a soapbox, but it's important that we remember that. But part of why the Levitical system is so convoluted is to point to us to our need for a Savior. Uh, David says in Psalm 11, In the Lord I put my trust. How say, ye to my, how say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? His mountain, his kingdom. We're longing for his kingdom. Christ's kingdom. It's in the Lord we put our trust, not in our own works, not in some earthly priesthood or some earthly temple or tabernacle. If the foundations, verse 3, be destroyed, what can the righteous do? See, our righteousness is nothing. So if we don't have the foundation of the word of God, and if we don't have our trust in Jesus Christ, we our righteousness counts for nothing. David continues in Psalm 12. Help, Lord, for the godly man seetheth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with a double heart they do speak. So he's talking about, hey, wickedness is abounding. I'm trying to follow you, Lord. How, what, what gives? Look, the reassurance, the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. So in a sense, we've talked about this. Again, reproving people of sin in love. In love. And if it can't be done in love, question whether you ought to do it at that moment or not. Because it's the job of the Lord to cut off flattering lips and tongues that speak proud things. Pride pride is a, is a cancer in the human heart and the collective soul of the nation. Pride is evil. Now, it's a, there's a difference between pride and having, having value in yourself and in what you mean to the Lord. Because the Lord died for you, and he loves you. We can have value in that. We can have value and glorify him with who we are. But pride is glorifying what we feel versus and against his good pleasure and good judgments and against his love, um, kicking against his love, rebelling against him, um, pridefulness, uh, and arrogance are huge, huge sins. Part of why sin exists. Um, the words of the Lord, verse six are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. We can trust in the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because when we're born again, washed in his blood, when we trust in him, Jesus Christ, that purification becomes ours in the eye of the Father. That's amazing. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. That's why we have the concept of eternal security, or whatever you want to call it. Everlasting life is a probably a better term. Surety of salvation. Because our, our righteousness is not seen in ourselves. It's seen in Jesus Christ. And whom he saves, he keeps. 
Well, what if I fall away? He keeps, he keeps you. He keeps your heart and mind. Can you sin? Absolutely you can. There's a war in the flesh. It doesn't make us sinless. But he holds you fast. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. I find this to be rather prophetic. I think the opposite is also true. When you see the vilest men who are being exalted and women, you can rest assured that the wicked are walking on every side. Especially when we live in a democratic republic and a uh, capitalist society, which I'm not bad-mouthing capitalism. It's the best system that we have. I really believe that. And I'm not trying to be political. I, among among <laughs> the systems, you don't see capitalism um, forcing social systems down people's throat at the barrel of a gun. Uh, at least not quite like socialism or communism or other forms of dictatorship or totalitarianism, but I digress. Um, but we vote with our dollars. So when you see evil rising to the top of the food chain, uh, when you see evil rising to the top of, uh, of government and evil rising to the top of um, um, social media, uh, entertainment, etc. You can tell that the wicked abound. Proverbs 25. Just remember what what is said earlier. I don't want to leave it at that. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that speaketh proud things. The Lord will have the victory. And he will rescue his own, those who have trusted in him. Um, Proverbs 25. I don't really... Man, there's some really good wisdom in here. Um, this glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out the matter. The heaven for height, the earth for death, and the heart of the king is unsearchable. We're called to a kingly level of a relationship with the royal king, Jesus Christ. God has glorified himself to put his truth within the pages of scripture. We just have to find them. We just have to read them. He's not trying to conceal them from us arbitrarily. No, but he wants us to search him out. You're not going to get to know him in the pages of scripture unless you read the scripture. That's my prayer that you're reading along today. Praise God. But yeah, there's some really good wisdom here. Um, Talking about blessing your enemies and then that way you heap coals of fire upon their head. It's not so you want them to end up in hell or Hades or the lake of fire. You're wanting them to suffer so they turn to right. Suffering and shame within this life can often be a blessing that leads us to reconciliation with Jesus Christ. Um... Verse 28, just hitting the high points, and there's probably more than this. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and hath and without walls. If you're not exercising self-control and submitting yourself to the Father's strength through his Holy Spirit, you are defenseless and already destroyed and that's not saying that you're not saved but you're you're left desolate not beyond repair jerusalem was brought back to repair and the wall around but if you are living in a state of a complete lack of self-control your effectiveness is in peril if it's not already destroyed Heed the warning. It's not a, it's not a con condemnation. It's a warning from a man who knows what it's like to be out of control, 
had hundreds of wives and concubines and just did not deny himself anything with, I'm sure he denied himself some things, but let's just leave it that he would live lavishly and live to regret it. Um, final notes here. First Thessalonians 4, he that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God who hath given unto us his Holy Spirit. We talked about reproving in love, and we've talked about it many times, and we will do so again. It's not our duty to despise other people, even if they're sinful. Because guess what? We're sinful. If you find yourself in a total and utter rage against somebody else because of what they have done to you, or even what they've done to somebody that you love, anybody in the world can do that. Pagans can do that. Atheists can do that. It's easy to get in a loyalty rage or a self-righteousness rage or even a real righteousness rage. We need to make sure that we're operating within God's will and context. Now, I leave it between you and the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to judge those matters. But if things are done in spite, without any love or any compassion for the eternal soul of somebody else, it's not of God. And it's sin against God to do so. Hating your brother is the same as murder. And then we come to verse 13. Through 18 and we might get into this more later when we visit Thessalonians again but this is what he was driving towards these people had been taught hastily and there had been false teachers trying to tell them that well frankly that those that they were in the last days and those who had gone before had missed the calling away of the church I believe that when the Lord descends from heaven this time with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, dead in Christ rising first, I do believe that this is a pre-tribulational rapture, getting caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. Jesus Christ said that he goes to prepare a place for us that where, we, that where he is, we may be also. If it were not so, he would have told us. Well, when he comes the second time, he's coming to establish his kingdom on the earth. Whether you believe it is the thousand-year reign of Jesus in Israel prior to the eternal order, which he will rule, which is what I believe, personally, is what I believe the scripture says, but even if you say the second coming is just, boom, eternity. Pretty much everybody agrees that the kingdom of the Lord is going to be on earth. Whether you're an amillennialist or a premillennialist. But if you are, if you do not believe in a rapture of the church prior to a seven-year tribulation, then you are not, then you're having the church rise to meet the Lord in the air and then turn it immediately right back down. You have uh, no preparing a place for us that where we, he is there, we may be also. Just some food for thought. Christ is coming to catch his church away. And he will bring his church back to earth when he establishes his kingdom. I firmly believe that. Are you going to be part of the kingdom? Do you trust in him today? Do you know that you are going to spend eternity with him? Or are you floating around on every wind of doctrine? Are you burning strange fire to that which you do not know? 
Are you wrapped up in your own ideas and your own conceit, your own philosophy and your own metaphysics, your own idea of science, your own pride? Saying that you trust in your own reason. Folks, feeble human reason does not stand against the Creator. And that Creator died for you so that you can be with Him forever. He loves you, and we love you. Have a good day.